All right, it looks like we have pretty much everyone here. Well, once again, a good evening and welcome to DC Who's Front Row. Uh, we have Lachlan Davis here tonight. So we are very, very excited to have her here. Uh, for those that are returning guests, welcome back. I see some familiar faces. And those that are new to these events, uh, this is a part of our Summer Artist Series. Uh, this platform is a way to just continue bringing you all exciting and culturally enriching and just entertaining experiences with some of our most talented and creative alumni. My name is Kim Edwards and I serve as one of the art and culture co-chairs here in Washington, D.C. And we just want to be able to bring you all as many dynamic and creative artists and different individuals that are in the area and some that are not in the area since we're virtual now. And this is really an exciting, exciting evening. So welcome, Lachlan. Hi. Um... My name is Lachlan Davis. Thank you so much for coming to the event tonight. Uh, I'm really looking forward to sharing my art and some of my story with y'all. Um, I hope that all of you are healthy and safe in this time. Um, and I'm really thankful that we're able to connect over Zoom. <laughs> yes. uh, thank you, Lachlan, just for being with us. Um, for those that don't know, she is such a trailblazer. Um, she's actually in Charleston, South Carolina this evening, um, where she lives, and she is such an amazing creator of oil paintings that really capture the complexities within architecture and landscape. And she has a really inspiring story that's also very relatable, I think, to a lot of people. Um, her paintings are somewhat, I would say, a reflection of you and your, your journey through um, your past and also speak to really your leap of faith when you trusted yourself and your skills. And I'm excited for you just to sh kind of share with the group a little bit of how you came into your craft um, and a little bit of that journey that you went through. Yeah. Um, so I started at UVA in 2014, graduated in 2018. Um, instead of my third year of college, I took a gap year. And that was a lot of reasons behind that decision, mostly because the first two years of college, um, I definitely felt like I had mostly just lost a sense of direction at the end of our second year we're supposed to declare a major and I just felt really overwhelmed by having to choose a specific path but then also just kind of the pressure of the tuition and choosing what courses and what I was going to be after graduation I just had no idea and so I guess I took a the leap of faith that Kim was talking about and deciding to take a leave of absence from the university to take some time to just decide how I like what direction I wanted to take my education um what I wanted to study and what I ended up doing was uh so after my second year of college it's summer of 2016 uh, I started a through hike of the Appalachian Trail. And so, <laughs> yeah, I can see. Not a small feat at all. <laughs> um, it was definitely a really weird thing to do. Um, mostly it was because I wanted to find something during my gap year that I could actually afford. Um, I didn't want to, I couldn't do some big program. Um, I knew that it was something that I could figure out as I went. Uh, it took a little while for me to convince my parents <laughs> that it was a good idea, but they ended up being on board. Um, I remember my dad and I road tripped up from Tennessee, which is where I'm from, to Maine. Mm -hmm. And when he dropped me off in the parking lot, he said, this is either the best thing I've ever done as a father or the stupidest thing I've ever done. Um, and so I ended up going from Maine and I made it halfway um, down to Harper's Ferry. So it took about four months of backpacking. Um, 
but yeah, it was definitely a pretty life-changing experience. Um, it was when I was 20, and so that was, I guess, one of the first times that I had just been that far away and completely by myself and on my own two feet. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, I think, I mean, for, for some of those that have taken that experience or that journey, I always feel as though it really is something that is both, you know, exciting, nerve wracking, somewhat spiritual in a way. Um, and for those, I, I saw some of the questions, um, a gap year is often just a time that people take either before going to their higher level schooling or during that schooling as a purpose or a way to kind of tap into their inner self, to ignore distractions, take a journey um, like yours, the Appalachian Trail, uh, just to kind of build that momentum in self-discovery. And it sounds like that's really what you were able to use it for, is that self-discovery to um, somewhat shift maybe your, your mindset and that momentum that you were going in when you were in school to something that was still in you, but just a, a different lens, so to speak. Yeah, I definitely was very perfectionistic going into college and very uptight, I guess. I know there's the UVA type and a lot of us are that way and kind yeah. of come <laughs> along the way and are able to calm down a bit. Um, <laughs> I was definitely one of those. And so I, I think the trail was just a really good space for me to be able to slow down um, and gain confidence. I was definitely lacking in that pretty significantly beforehand and also take a step away from the pressure of academics and lean more into my artwork. And so one of the things I decided to carry on the trail while I was backpacking and this was a big decision because when you're backpacking, you want the least amount of weight possible, is I actually carried a watercolor set. And so I would stop in the middle of the day, um, mostly because when I started, I was pretty out of shape. And so it was really hard to be able to hike the entire day through. Um, I'd be able to make it like, you know, 10 or 12 miles and I'd just be exhausted. So I'd take like the midday break and pull up my watercolor set and be able to paint what I saw. Um, from the actual water of at the source oh, and wow. so I like brought some of the watercolors to show here so oh yeah kind of how it started and I would carry these as I went with me so this one is actually from Maine um this one's from Maine also oh that looks beautiful um and then this one is from New Hampshire oh wow so when you were kind of taking those breaks, so to speak, on the trail and painting, um, were you just going through and painting what you saw or kind of painting what you wanted to see throughout that journey? It was kind of a mix of both. I think that especially, these were like some of my first paintings of that type. I had done art in high school, but never quite for myself. Um, and the way that I was able to on the trail and that it was just like I was the only one witnessing it it was just for me and I was mostly limited I guess by my skill set it takes a lot of practice to be able to actually paint what you want to paint <laughs> sometimes it's just you end I up believe that. As, yeah. as a novice mm. <laughs> um and so it was really it really just like sparked that curiosity for me of just being able to have that practice of being able to observe my space and be quiet and just focus on it. Um, I felt like it was a way that I could kind of find a calm within myself. And after I finished the backpacking trip, it was definitely one of the things that I took with me from it of being able to just include that practice in my everyday. That's actually, it was gonna be a question of mine. Um, when I think about someone that takes a journey like that, that is multiple days, multiple weeks of just alone time and a way to be centered and grounded, so to speak, um, 
kind of how do you continue that? How do you tap back into that sense of calm and peace? Um, what do you do now? Or is painting your way of tapping back into those moments? I would say painting is still very much that way of finding quiet and being able just to use it as a tool to reflect on my surroundings. So most of the time the subjects that I'll choose to paint are either landscapes that are really meaningful to me and just full of memories, or they're, if they're a custom commission, it's kind of a story that I can take from somebody else and be able to provide that gift of making their own story or memory into a piece. Um, so it, it still has that sense of like calm and reflection. Um, when I came back to Charlottesville after doing my backpacking trip, I started, I, I honestly think back on it and I don't necessarily know how it is so like bold, <laughs> but I would uh, end up doing plein air paintings around the university grounds. And so I would like lug this sort of box easel around and um, set it up someplace on grounds, especially early in the morning. I would try to go as early as like seven so that nobody would see me that I knew oh. and I would choose some space to be able to paint. And so that's kind of how it started. Um, I used, instead of watercolors, I started using what's called a palette knife. Um, I have it here. This is the one I always use. It's you use this to scrape the paint instead of a brush. But yeah, I definitely continue to use that practice of being able to find a quiet space and then paint the landscape. Um, that sounds great. And I was going to ask um, about the tools and techniques. I think it's probably a question that several people have. Um, when we think about any artist, right, we kind of want to have that opportunity to see what you see or be able to work through you um, and see that process. So if it's okay with you, I'll share my screen and kind of give viewers an opportunity to see what you do and let you talk them through it. Okay, so this is pretty much a time lapse video of an entire, the process of painting an entire landscape piece. Um, so I started out with my palette here. And so that's the palette knife that you see. It's literally just a knife and you'll mix all the colors. I prime all of my own canvases. And so I staple the canvas to a wooden frame. I do each composition based on a grid. And so I'll put it out on grid paper and then I'll translate it with a charcoal pencil onto the canvas. And so you see here, it's literally just kind of piece by piece, you fill it in with the colors. Um, normally I start with the sky space just because, I don't know, for me, it kind of just grounds the painting and starts to bring it to life. Um, and you can see that I'm literally just scraping the paint onto the canvas, just taking it from the palette and then just little by little shading it. I don't use a brush usually at all. Um, it's, I don't know, are there any other questions about the process? The video is about 10 minutes, so I think we're going to keep it going on in the background um, while we keep on talking about the art itself. Yeah, I think so. It's, um, I, I see the beautiful painting that you have in the picture and, you know, once we get through, everyone will be able to see that kind of final product. Um, but a question that I've always had, um, being a fan of yours and looking at your, your work, I've always wanted to know if UVA was somewhat a muse for you, um, because I know a lot of your paintings are the, the refined structures and somewhat iconic statues and things like that that we see on ground. Um, can you shed some light on what you use to really drive your, your paintings? Yeah, so I, something that I've noticed in the art industry or the painting industry is that there's kind of two avenues that an artist can go down. It's either you have these paintings that are really geared towards interior design and these like, 
They're really pretty pictures that you can put on a wall and it'll brighten up a room. It'll make you feel good when you look at it. It's beautiful. Um, and then I guess the other avenue would just kind of be this like commentary on society or some aspect of politics or just the contemporary culture. And I think that mostly when I paint, I really want to find a way to bridge those two avenues mm -hmm. where I can create something that will brighten somebody's day um, or brighten somebody's home when it's on their wall and make them kind of think of this happy memory. And so this is actually a commissioned painting of the Rotunda. Um, it's a woman was giving it to her friend as her wedding gift because they just had so many good memories at the university. Um, but I think that kind of what I would want to avoid is pa painting like icons or logos or just really sentimental subjects because I think for me the university like I love UVA and UVA has given me so much, but it's definitely not perfect. And my time there was pretty complicated and really difficult and challenging. And I think a lot of people feel that way um, where they can be so grateful for the experience, but also have a lot of mixed feelings. And so I think one of the ways that I try to capture that complexity is through the style itself of just being able to layer color on color on color on color and have all these spaces that you can look at the painting and it kind of almost is unstable in a way or flickering. Um, it's definitely not just a beautiful sheen. Uh, there's kind of a lot of different ways that you can interpret it. Um, right. Yeah. And yeah. So I mean, and I love that you speak to the layers right of of your work because i think that you can relate that to life and you talk about the the different aspects and different experiences people have on grounds um and i wonder too what your take is on art and culture and especially painters how do you think they contribute to society especially during times where people might have mixed feelings about what's going on. Yeah, so I think artists, so the artist role in society, it also kind of has that double facet where you have one side of, I think that artists can serve as a way to um, provide what, what I call an aesthetic mnemonic which is pretty much just kind of a fancy way of saying like an artful way of remembering something. And so I actually majored in art history at EVA. Um, and one of the things that we learned is that art was used as a tool for people to communicate or remember a story about themselves. Um, and I think that especially now with social media or Instagram or just the clutter of digital photography, there's definitely this sense of anxiety that we have around being able to capture our stories or our memories and be able to share them in this beautiful way. And we want to remember it, but we also want to show it to other people in a way that maybe is more beautiful than it actually was in reality. And there's all these sort of problematic facets to that. And I think that with painting or just with art in general, what the artist can provide is a way for people to remember something that is meaningful to them and gives them just kind of those positive feelings but isn't necessarily um, drowned in the digital clutter. And it's, I, I think with art, you can create the aesthetic memory in a way that you can capture reality more than you can with 
than with a photograph, because I think a lot of what we remember isn't necessarily what we see or what we observe. Um, and so with the university paintings, I definitely try to do provide that for people of being able to capture a piece of the university landscape, but not necessarily just what could be captured in a photo um, of just kind of being able to capture the, the fall leaves and the beautiful blue sky and all the kind of swirling colors, layered colors in between that. Um, so that's the first spiel on the role of the artists in society. And then I think that the other side of it, and this is actually based on a Kurt Vonnegut quote, is that artists can be the canary in the coal mine. Um, I think a lot of times I, artists are very, they allow themselves to be very sensitive in a world that can be overwhelming and to feel deeply and to look at things and really, really observe things and try to apply meaning to it. Um, and it's a pretty steep challenge. And I think that what Vonnegut meant by the canary in the coal mine is that it's kind of like the artist can take the temperature of society and show us where we are. And so we're in a really weird time right now, like a really, really weird time right now. And I think that I would be really interested to see how artists will respond in the coming months or coming years. Um, because we can look at the news all day and probably not necessarily get the same amount of information that we can from somebody who's looked at it really thoughtfully and been able to apply it into this piece that they've worked on. Um, yeah. 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 I, I mean, I love the, the perspective that you take on that. And, you know, there's no right or wrong reason. It's really what you feel inside and what you're producing with your art. And I think that how art is really a, a way to kind of preserve almost what is going on around the artist or the individual. And it mirrors your work, right? With landscape, um, there is no real end point because landscape changes, it moves. Um, art, especially in, in outside scenery and even architecture itself, it's somewhat of a living subject, right? What someone paints today may not look like what someone else paints tomorrow based on what happens in the environment. So I think it's really interesting to kind of capture that and capture the essence of that um, and, and to see how things change throughout your work and throughout what you see and really how others interpret it also. Because I, I know you do work um, through commission from other people and um, it's interesting, I would think, to know what certain people might ask you to paint for them or what speaks to them and that, what they want to capture. Um, would you mind telling us maybe some thoughts or reactions people have had to your work? Yeah, um, I think most often the commissions, I, I do a lot of university scenes for alums, which I love. Um, it's definitely, there's a lot of really beautiful places to be able to capture. Um, the Rotunda, yes, but I think that there's a lot of scenes at UVA that kind of go underappreciated. Uh, one of my favorite scenes is like a view down the colonnade, um, kind of looking at the ginkgo or the chapel. Uh, another one is the view of the willow at Dell Pond. That's one of my favorite places to just walk by on my way to class. Um, so that's like definitely one of the main subjects. Um, I think other commissions that I'll get will be ways to capture just what is a meaningful moment in somebody's life. So sometimes um, I'll have somebody who's moving out of their childhood home and they want to get a painting of that home so that they can hang it on their wall in their new home. And that's really beautiful. Um, I think a lot of times I'll get, uh, somebody will give 
a painting of the wedding bouquet and the still life um, to the bride on the, as a gift. Um, things like that where it's maybe a still life or architecture or a landscape, um, but for the person that it's being painted for, it's so much more. Um, yeah, I love being able to just hear the stories and then reflect on the stories and being able to provide that service for people. It's amazing. Right. I mean, it, it sounds like it too. It's always interesting what people want to capture. Um, yeah. I can definitely relate to like the homes and the bouquet, really sentimental moments in people's lives. And especially when you have a great artist that really captures that, um, the essence, the colors, the textures, you know, it, it feels more than, than it would if it were a photograph, like you said earlier. Um, a couple questions I have regarding the technique. Um, looking back at the, the final product or what you're producing, um, I see that your, your painting, is it more of on top of the underdrawing or um, do you use anything that's over the charcoal? Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, so I'll use a grid. Um, okay. Normally I'll take a, a few reference photos and sometimes I'll manipulate the composition in Photoshop um, okay. of just being able to get the composition that I want the painting to end up being. And then I'll take that and then being able to translate it into a sketch, um, put a grid on top of that sketch and then It'll be like a 36 by 36 inch painting, let's say. And on the grid, I'll be able to, it, it's just literally grid paper and draw all of those out and then draw out the corresponding, like scale it up onto the canvas. And so in each square, I know exactly where the lines are going to go. And mostly that just makes it so that, especially when you're painting architecture, architecture is not very forgiving. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of straight lines and a lot of details to be able to catch. And if you have the perspective slightly off, then it, it can be a little bit disastrous. <laughs> so I definitely try to, with architecture especially, draw it out all out beforehand. And then um, from there, I'll mix my colors. And like I said, I only use the knife. Um, that's mostly just because I don't know, at first when I started painting, I mean, I still have limited space. It's a factor of being in my early 20s, I guess. <laughs> so if you use oil paints, you need to have studio space and you need to have ventilation if you're using brushes and all the brush cleaners and it, it can get really smelly um, and there's a lot of fumes. And so I was like, okay, well, what if I just don't use a brush and don't use the brush cleaner and just literally just scrape it on there and layer it and layer it. Mm -hmm. um, and then it just became this way that I was, I, I don't know, it just feels like an extension of my arm with the knife. I've used it so much. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I'll layer it right on top of the sketch. Um, and I'll mix most of the colors beforehand. In the particular painting we were looking at, um, I kind of mixed it in stages where I started off with, okay, here's all the colors I'm gonna use for the sky and then put it down and then just would like take little by little. Um, for the grass, that was, it's a technique that I call micro abstraction, okay. which is pretty much just a way of saying, uh, there are a lot of colors within a small amount of space and it's kind of pixelated or layered or, um, yeah, so for the grass, you probably could see in the video that it was, you kind of start out with one color and then you pixelate it, pixelate it, pixelate it. And it just kind of has that feeling of going like in and out and moving and vibrating. And it gives a sense of like just liveliness to the painting. Um, and then once I start on the architecture, I have to think about, okay, well, where's the light coming from? What is, uh, whites are never whites. Um, and so like, for instance, the columns, it's, 
you have like yellow where the light is hitting it or where the sun is hitting it and then you have a blue where it's in shadow and then same for the brick you have to think about like this bright orange for where the sun is hitting it and maybe this darker like burgundy for where it's in shadow and just really being able to calculate all of those things as you're going so that you can bring a landscape to life and it looks as if it would if you're walking by it but I, almost more um like it I, I think I definitely try to capture a landscape how it is in my head rather than how it would be in a photograph and just like brighten it and mm -hmm. make it just more vibrant right right and it, it sounds like you have a lot of influences too and you have a a technique that works for you and also you're still incorporating different um, aspects of the craft itself as you're progressing through your art um, to to really make it your own and make it unique um, I know several people that have your paintings um, they were very excited when I told them I was going to be speaking with you <laughs> um, and I think that's that's something to be said right that your paintings are um, identifiable and people love them and really appreciate the time and the skill sets that you put into them. Um, I think right now, if you're comfortable, I'd love to transition into um, a more formal question and answer. I think that some of the audience members might have some questions. I know I have plenty, but we can always chat. <laughs> Um, so I'll ask a couple questions and for those that are listening, feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll get through as many as possible. Um, I know first and foremost, inspiration is a question that plenty of people have and it did come up this evening. So I definitely want to ask you, is there an artist or someone that you know, maybe in your personal life that you've spent time with or mentored that really inspired you? Um, Georgia O'Keeffe's work or anyone else that is notable? Um, how would you answer that question? Oh goodness. Um, well, any art museum that I go into is like my favorite day. And also I just like get very overwhelmed. I can only take kind of one chunk at a time <laughs> because I'll just be so excited. Um, I think Definitely 19th century oil painters. I just think that that was just uh, kind of the where mm, it went from being very, very realistic to going very, very abstract in the span of 100 years. Mm -hmm. And I think that in between um, is what I love. And so a lot of people love the Impressionists. I, I love the Impressionist painters. Um, they're really amazing paintings because it just captures the going I think it really captures what I was talking about earlier of painting kind of how we feel about a landscape rather than painting the landscape itself mm -hmm. um, and so that definitely is inspiring to me I think that mostly I get really inspired by the way that how when you look at something and just read it for what it is and then you look at it and you really look at it and you break it down into colors and shapes and forms and you see that that shadow over there has a darker bright blue and you didn't necessarily read it as that before because it's just a sidewalk and sidewalks aren't blue <laughs> and I, I think that I kind of love the feeling of breaking what I see, just breaking it down into parts and then building it back together. Um, mm. I think that it's almost like the feeling of cleaning a house, <laughs> which sounds really funny, but it's like a, when you clean a house, you feel a lot more at home after it because you've like broken it down and you've put it back together and you just have this relationship with all the different objects. And I mm. think that when I'm able to paint, it just makes me feel a lot more at home in a space, or it makes me feel like I belong. Um, 
I think that one of the reasons why I like started painting UVA so often is because those first two years, I very much felt like I did not belong. And so oh. it was almost like a tool for, uh, not j just like belonging to my environment. Um, so that's probably my major inspiration. <laughs> interesting. You touched on the example that you gave about the sidewalk and the lighting, and it prompts an, another question about that regarding how does light or weather or any somewhat environmental factors shape your paintings, or do they influence your paintings at all? Yeah. Um, let's see. So I think that mostly environmental factors, especially I love painting reflections. Um, I recently painted a view of the marsh down here in Charleston um, and that had some reflections on the water. I think that the color that you choose for the sky can really affect the mood of the painting. Um, and so whether you go for like a yellow or a purple or just a bright blue um, or like a vibrant sunset that really changes the mood. Um, so whenever I do a commission, I'm really intentional about asking them like, so what season should it be? And what kind of weather should it be? And what kind of time of day? Just because, uh, yeah, it affects the painting so much um, of where the light is. And I think being able to plan out where the shadows will be really, I, I think that as I practiced more and more, um, that was where I felt myself improve a lot, where I think when I first started, I wasn't necessarily able to see it or identify it. I was mostly just fighting against the paint and trying to figure out how in the world like to make it look even like anything. <laughs> right, right. Um, and then sort of you you take that and then you like go up and scale a little bit and you're able to say, oh wait, there's that small shadow there where the light comes through this roof line um, and it's a different color. And then you're able to, I, I guess like find this, the strange shadows um, and, it, and it just makes it so much more interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I imagine the, all the angles and shadows and, and any change really changes your feeling and the, the spirit kind of behind the painting and that in turn changes how you approach it or how you approach the entire picture. Um, you mentioned Charleston and we all know that you live there. Is there any reason in particular, um, maybe like the scenery or something that we don't know that prompted you to move there? Yeah, so I... I moved here a year ago from this month, which is kind of crazy to think about. Uh, it's flowing by, but I mostly came down here because I wanted to, I, I lived in Charlottesville for a year past graduation, um, and I knew that I wanted to move to a new place and probably a southern city. So I'm, I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, and so it wouldn't be too much of a culture shock, but it would still be a change. and. Charleston seemed like a place that was affordable and also it has a lot of paintings. Um, there's an art gallery <laughs> around every corner. Right. And so when I first moved here, I started working for an art gallery. Um, and that was a really amazing way to sort of see the behind the scenes of the art industry. I, I, I think it's like, I realized how naive I had been when I first started out. Um, and I, I think that that was a really good experience to just sort of see the behind the scenes of what it is to run a gallery and sell paintings every day and what people are looking for when they come in. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I want to, I'm going to come back to that because I, I have a question. Um, I'm going to go through everyone else's questions, but I have a question about that. Um, a question that came up speaks to how the woodlands from your journey on the Appalachian Trail inspires you when you're reflecting on maybe a next painting or the story behind paintings. Can you speak to that a little bit? The question is how the... Um, the woodlands from the App Trail or 
you know, things that you saw if that inspires you um, in your paintings now? Yeah, I would say this probably isn't necessarily the answer that they were expecting, but I think the major way that the Appalachian Trail has affected the way that I paint is just through the confidence that it gave me. I think that okay. being able to be totally alone in the woods and sleep in the woods all alone, <laughs> hundreds of miles away from anybody that you know, <laughs> um, it was really scary. <laughs> and it was so different and so amazing. And, but I, a lot of it I spent just really like scared and just having to constantly have this battle within myself of I'm just like take another step forward you can do this like be strong and you see the dark woods around you and there's probably nothing there that sound that you hear is just a squirrel or a mouse or not a bear mm -hmm. and um, self-talk <laughs> yeah yeah self-talk self-talk <laughs> so um I, I think that that sense of just being able to go into the unknown and be confident in your own judgment. Um, because the, the way that I would describe the painting is the painting is really just a series of decisions. It's just a series of like small decisions. Every brush stroke or I guess knife stroke in my case is a decision that you intentionally make. Um, and each of those requires some sense of like deliberateness and confidence and I, I think that yeah the trail definitely gave me a space to gain that confidence. <laughs> I, I can't imagine so I can't imagine being alone in the woods everything that you've done amazes me so uh, definitely appreciate you and and what it brought out of you um, I think we all appreciate what it brought out of you uh, there's a question that kind of goes back to earlier when we were speaking to UVA and grounds and the architecture there. Does the style of Thomas Jefferson's aesthetics, so the art, architecture, framing, even politics perhaps, um, how does his design influence you or does it influence at all? Yeah, so I think this kind of goes off what we were saying before is that I think that one of the ways, so I was talking earlier about how when I paint a landscape, it kind of gives me a way to feel like I belong. Um, it also, growing up in the American South, it, there's so many contradictions and so many things that are really beautiful and also really problematic. and it's like how can you love a landscape that is as complicated as it is and is not this beautiful sheen that I, I think sometimes people portray it to be um and so with the university of virginia like and i think we can all agree that it gives us so many opportunities but it has a really layered and complex history that i don't <laughs> agree with. Um, and so I think that being able to love something that is not perfect mm -hmm. and being able to acknowledge those imperfections just within the way that you portray it, um, I try to be really mindful of that because I don't, I don't want to be insensitive and just yeah, I just, just put a beautiful sheen over what is real and what is real to so many people. Um, and I don't want to summarize it either. Right. I think that when I paint like any, I, I guess the two subjects that I probably am, am most passionate about would be pa paintings of the American South, mm -hmm. of which I include the University of, Lansk the University of Virginia Landscapes in that. Um, so it's doesn't consider itself to be a Southern University now, but its founding it definitely was. Um, and then landscapes of kind of American wildernesses, um, which are like any mountain paintings or trail paintings. Um, 
and I think both of those things, I, yeah, I guess it, it's just you want to capture how it feels, um, and you don't want to just summarize it. Um, right. And that makes sense. It speaks to yeah. what you said earlier about how things might change or people's perception might influence the painting. And you can have two paintings, even if it's the same artist, of the same structure or the same landscape. And the interpretation would definitely be different based on the set of eyes that see it, the, the past and the, the internal experiences and external experiences, right? Even if it's still right. on ground, very different experiences. Um, and so it's interesting that that you say that. I think it it's consistent really throughout your paintings and throughout your your expression of what you're seeing. And um, I appreciate that. I appreciate that honesty and, and transparency. Um, a question that I had, uh, we referenced earlier a little bit of some of that finance background and the bookkeeping. So I, I did want to come back to that. I think it's interesting. What would you say? Uh, is something that you would probably maybe do differently or how maybe you've had a new revelation now that you've graduated, you've been working in both the field of finance and as an artist and as a painter. What have you learned from that experience and what have you changed perhaps now that you know more of kind of the, the bookkeeping side of things? Yeah, um... I feel like a lot of, so, so when I moved to Charleston, the way that I got the job at the gallery was I offered to be the full charge bookkeeper, which was quite a challenge. <laughs> um, I think that I, it was a really good lesson because I was definitely able to, to learn all of those skills. Um, I graduated from UVA in English and art history. And so I had no finance background, um, no accounting background. Uh, I, I, I think it was a really good lesson in how important it is to be able to be financially responsible and be accountable to what you put out there and what you sell and what you buy. And especially if you're in a gallery setting where mm -hmm. artists are consigning their art to you and depending upon that gallery for part of their living. Um, I think that it was definitely a really frustrating job because I was around a lot of people that were artsy types. And I, I think that there's this myth that like, accounting principles don't apply to art people. <laughs> I to ask your thoughts on, on that specifically, the dichotomy between liberal arts in that world, so to speak, and then the finance world. Um, I know my time on grounds, those worlds didn't collide, they didn't intermingle, and so I find it very interesting that you made that work. Yeah, I think um, it was a really good lesson because I was definitely under the mindset, well, I think UVA has a really well-rounded student, um, but then you're kind of told that you have to choose a line of study and you can go into engineering, you can go into finance, you can go into the liberal arts. Um, and I think that after graduating, I realized how important it is to be able to have an understanding of multiple fields because if I were to only focus on art then I, I think I'm limiting myself so much and so the wild thing about taking the bookkeeping job in the gallery is that what I thought what I was getting into was actually well, what I thought what I was getting into was a learning of the contemporary art market, but it ended up just being the importance of accounting principles. And so after that, I was like, okay, I need to get educated on this because this is important. And I started working for a local CPA firm. 
And so that's my full-time day job now is we do auditing for nonprofits in Charleston. Um, and that was a pretty major swerve because I didn't yeah. really know that that was something that I would be passionate about because I had always kind of put the label on myself of being an art person. Um, but I think it was a good lesson because I realized that the labels that we put on ourselves are more limiting than not. I think that to, to do art is not a label, but a tool. Mm -hmm. So I can use art as a tool to be able to express myself. Um, I can use accounting as a, as a tool to be able to take action or just to be impactful. Um, and, and I think that, I don't know, I think that UVA is amazing because it puts so many different people together that have these different interests. Um, but I definitely wish that there wasn't so much of so there, I wish that there wasn't so much separation between those disciplines. I think it, mm. yeah. Yeah, and I, I love that you said that too, that separation, because that really, the way you described your your shift, we'll say, or your kind of transformation into art and finance and kind of almost going back and forth, it sounds like, a little bit and in intermingling the two really allow for you to flourish in both arenas. And it's, it's quite frankly amazing because I think that it's a story inside. It really is. It's a side of art that not everyone talks about, right? The kind of bookkeeping side, the business side um, that really keeps things afloat. But they talk about the inspiration and creativity, which is equally as important. Uh, I wonder, too, if there is somewhat of an influence or um, a continuation of this education uh, that you're doing now, now that you are working on that side? Um, what are you doing to kind of learn more? Yeah, so I am enrolled in UVA's, uh, I forget the act, it's SPCS School of Professional, S the, the, the School of Continuing Education um, for their Certificate of Accounting program. So they have an online program with that where I'll be able to take classes. Um, I started some online classes this past spring, and so I'm transferring into UVA's program. So I'll get to be a double who, which is really exciting. Um, it makes the UVA paintings I'm doing now even more significant, I suppose. And it'll definitely be a pretty big shift. Um, I think right now I'm in a phase where I'm trying to be able to reconcile it in my head of how can you be an artist and also be an accountant? Like that just doesn't, I, that seems really strange. And I don't think I really expected myself to like that field so much. Um, but I think that the two have a lot of similarities and I, I think that you can definitely have multiple aspects of your personality that can be captured by different disciplines. Um, and so hopefully they'll kind of, the accounting education will make me more effective as an artist professional and the art will hopefully give me a wonderful creative outlet from all the spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> I love um, that. Yeah. Um, I have one more question from the audience and then we'll, I'm looking at the time. I want to be respectful of people's yeah. time. Um, there is a question regarding UVA faculty. Now, was there anyone in particular or it, maybe it wasn't a faculty member, but a mentor that you had while you were at UVA that somewhat stood as an inspiration? Yes, but I, there was not necessarily any particular. I was like definitely a pretty under the radar student. <laughs> That's okay. That's a lot of y'all can relate sometimes. Um, but yeah, I, there are so many people that I really admire. Um, but yeah, none, none in particular that I would name. Yeah, that's okay. Well, honestly, I know I truly, truly appreciate the time that you've spent with me and us this evening uh, and really talking about us all, the work, the inspiration, uh, hearing about what you value. And we really appreciate you just being transparent with us this evening. 
I know that I didn't get through all the questions and I do apologize, but I do think we've learned so much about you. And I know that you are in Charleston, but I know that we probably have plenty of people that want to get to know you and just really find different ways to connect with you um, or perhaps purchase one of your paintings. So I did put your information in the chat. There's your website, the documentary if anyone wants to know more about you, and also the tutorial. Um, just so the audience knows, the video that we watched this evening does have an audio portion if you want to paint along or if you want to watch it again, that's also in the chat. And um, lock on, I'll give you, we're right at seven o'clock, but if you have any upcoming events, I know that you have um, an exhibition coming up in 2021. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, we'll see what happens and what changes happen with COVID, okay. but I'll be participating in an exhibition that celebrates the 100th anniversary of the McIntyre School at EVA. And oh. so they have invited me to exhibit several of my works in the actual school. Um, I'm really looking forward to it and I'll definitely be able to post kind of a corresponding online exhibition so that it'll be accessible to people on or off grounds. Um, and the exhibition itself will, will be a lot of just Charlottesville landscapes um, to just celebrate the local environment and the architecture and kind of what we touched on before of really just utilizing the style of micro abstraction to capture the complexity of home and also its beauty. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Well, I definitely will keep a lookout for that. Um, and once again, thank you. And thank you for everyone that signed in tonight. I'm just grateful for the opportunity to spend the evening with everyone. Uh, but thank you for UVA and their Office of Engagement for letting me put this on and for the DC Who's. If this is an event that you enjoyed, um, let us know. Follow us on Instagram, DC Who's, or just let us know via um, the chats or emails. And we'll continue to put on these events as long as people are interested and engaged. I know I really had a great time. So thank you again. And um, thank you. And good night to everyone.